All right, good morning. Welcome to Mountain View Baptist Church. We're glad you're here this morning. Thank you for joining us again on Facebook Live. Let's all stand and sing, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Tarquino, would you open us in a word of prayer, please? Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. Good to see you in church today. What a great day. The sun is shining, and I know it's not warm yet, but I've heard it's going to be in the 60s this week or close to it, and uh, that's exciting. I don't know if you're ready for that or not, but it's uh, it, it's coming. And spring's almost here. It's exciting to uh, to be coming to that time. It's been a good winter, I think. Most of us maybe could say that, but uh, we're ready ready for it to get warmer. Um, and I'm excited about that. I'm excited about being in church today, about seeing what God has for us. Uh, please keep the Kriyas in prayer. Pastor and Mrs. Kriya are in Goose Creek, 
I think I almost said Goose Neck this morning. Goose Creek, South Carolina at Trident Baptist Church and uh, preaching for Pastor Tharp. And please keep them in prayer. And we're excited about that opportunity for them. Yeah, but we're excited about what God is doing here. We had a great early service, a great crowd, and a good Sunday school. And we're here this morning at our 11 o'clock service, uh, just gathering together to worship the Lord. Just a couple uh, quick announcements. We're excited to be able to have some things on the calendar to be able to look forward to. We're going to be getting back to Bible studies this month. And I believe the ladies' Bible study is coming up on the 20th of March. I'm pretty sure that's the date. And then the men's Bible study will be on the 27th. And so that's the last Saturday morning. And we'll continue, guys, with our Bible study the last Saturday morning. And, uh, and every month we'll have our Bible study at 8.30. And I'd really like to encourage you to come out to these if you can. The Bible studies are great opportunities uh, to fellowship, to get out of maybe the regular church setting and just dig into the Bible and be a blessing and encouragement to each other. And of course, there's food and coffee, and uh, we're already gearing up for ours, guys. We got coffee ready. We're going to have an omelet station set up, and it's going to be great. So uh, I'm excited about that. I don't know what the ladies are going to do, but guys, we're going to have good stuff. I'm kidding. I'm sure theirs will be great, too. They always do a good job. But that'll be coming up at the end of the month. And then we have a, our first teen activity in a while. We're going to have a uh, scavenger hunt on the 27th, that same evening. will be 5 o'clock at the church. And teens, make sure you plan to come out to that. We're going to have a good time. And it's been a year since we've had an activity like that. We did a, a scavenger hunt last March right at the beginning of everything. And so we're excited to be able to get back to that. And then we have a youth rally coming up in April at Heritage Baptist Church in Norwood, Massachusetts. That's Pastor Tom Crampert, and when we get closer to that, I'll give you a little bit more information, but I'm excited about uh, teens being able to go to that activity and uh, just being able to have some of these things back on the calendar. We're just a month away from Easter. The very first Sunday morning uh, in April will be Easter Sunday, and that's always a great day here at the church, and so we're excited about, about that. And today is our first day for choir practice. Uh, this afternoon, five o'clock choir practice. I'm excited to get the choir back together. And uh, maybe you wanted to be in choir or you would like the opportunity. Well, now's your chance. You can meet with us today, five o'clock. Uh, there's no auditions. You don't need to have a certain skill set to be in choir. I mean, hopefully you can carry a tune. But if not, you can make a joyful noise. You can smile and be there. Um, but we, we uh, are excited about being able to meet again. So that's today at five o'clock. And we'll begin working on music for Easter. And that'll be our first time singing. will be Easter Sunday morning. Um, I'd like to give you the missionaries of the week. This week we're praying for the Kendrick family, Evangelist J Jason Kendrick. They're the, it's the uh, tent uh, revival ministry, and they've been praying um, for their, uh, their coach bus um, that they've been trying to raise money for that will help them as they travel. And so we want to keep that in prayer as the Kendrick family is, is trying to raise money for that. And then also the Lafanier family, the missionary uh, church planner to Fairfield Baptist Church in Fairfield, Connecticut. We appreciate the Lafanier family. Please keep them in prayer. They're praying uh, just for God to help with their finances. They've had several families leave due to COVID, and they're looking to raise some of that money um, and, and kind of having a tough time making their bills. So please keep that in prayer. Uh, we know how it's affected everybody, and especially a, a young church plant like that is, has many struggles. So let's keep uh, the Lafreniere family in prayer and the Kendrick family in prayer. I believe that's all of the announcements. I always feel like when pastor's not here, I go through the announcements really fast, but that's, that's I think, everything we have uh, to get through. Are there any birthdays? Anybody celebrating a birthday that we can sing to? Mrs. Brewer, how are we doing? Not today. All right. Well, if you're here and, and it is your birthday, you, you got away. All right. How about wedding anniversaries? Hi. <laughs> happy anniversary. We won't sing to you without your husband here, but happy anniversary. How many years? 22 years. That's awesome. Well, please tell, please tell Mike happy anniversary from us. and well, That's awesome. We're excited for that. Any other anniversaries? Absolutely, and I forget. I saw. I didn't. I, remember, I forget the number, but uh, how many years when they have gotten married? Seventy-six years. So we appreciate that. Appreciate testimony. 
for the Lenny, and and uh, hey, that's great. I, I love hearing about about these uh, families and, and couples and marriages, and, and they're great examples for the rest of us. All right, well, we're going to sing out again. Let's stand up for the Aaron. Come lead us in the next song. All right, let's stand and sing. His strength is perfect. This time we'll have our special music, and if you could please turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll turn our Bibles there, and Melissa's going to come and sing for us. And then one other quick announcement, we uh, won't be having a pass the, the plate offering, but there will be in-person giving in the back afterwards. If you'd like to uh, give that way, or you can send in your tithe or do it online, but it, it, we don't need to be reminded that God is faithful to us, and we need to be faithful to Him in our tithes and offerings, and that will be available after the service. But we'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 this morning. Um, but I pray as, as we kind of get into the, the, this part of the service, let's just set our hearts and our minds upon the Lord and put everything else out of our minds and ask God to speak to us. My heart is so proud, my mind is so unfocused, I see the things you do through me, as great things I have done, and now you gently break me. Then lovingly you take me And hold me as my father And mold me as my maker I ask you how many times will you pick me up When I keep on letting you down 
And each time I will fall short of your glory, how far will forgiveness abound? And you answer, my child, I love you. And as long as you're seeking my face, you'll walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace. At times I may grow weak and feel a bit discouraged knowing that someone somewhere could do a better job for who am I to serve you I know I don't deserve you and that's the part that burns in my heart and keeps me hanging on I ask you how many times will you pick me up when I keep on letting you down and each time I will fall short of your glory, how far will forgiveness abound? And you answer, my child, I love you. And as long as you're seeking my face, you'll walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace. You are so patient with me, Lord. As I walk with you, I'm learning what your grace really means. The price that I could never pay was paid at Calvary. So instead of trying to repay you, I'm learning to simply obey you by giving up my life to you for all that you've given to me. I ask you how many times will you pick me up when I keep on letting you down? And each time I will fall short of your glory, how far will forgiveness abound? And you answer, my child, I love you. And as long as you're seeking my face, you'll walk in the path of my daily sufficient grace. Thank you so much for that song. It goes right along with our thought this morning. First, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll begin reading this morning. We'll get right into the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> in verse number 1, we'll, we'll read um, beginning in the first verse. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter. 
Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. This is our text verse. Unless I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your people. Thank you for this place. Lord, I don't know what every person is going through. I don't know what kind of week they've had. I don't know where their heart, their mind is this morning. I don't know what kind of struggles they are facing, what kind of battles they're fighting. But God, I know that you do. And God, I know that you've impressed this passage upon my heart this morning. And God, I pray that I'll get out of the way and you'll speak. God, I believe there's someone in here that needs to hear this. I believe maybe it's every person. I believe it hits each of us, Lord. If you've spoken to my heart, I believe it'll speak to every heart. But God, I pray that we'll be attentive this morning. I pray we won't be distracted. I pray our minds won't be wandering, but we'll be tuned into what you have. God, I pray that you will fill me with your spirit, Lord, and use me this morning. Father, please bless Pastor as he's preaching in South Carolina. Bless him and bless the church there. Lord, I pray that you will work with the kids programs in the back and father in here in every heart i pray you'll move in a special way this morning lord we need your help we need you to do that which we can't do and we'll trust in you for it in jesus name we pray amen i've had a few uh, experiences in my life when i've been able to meet someone that would be um considered a famous a celebrity we were at the Boston Aquarium last year, and we were wandering through, and we got to uh, go up to the, the, the top exhibit, kind of in the corner, and we were um, able to see the octopus. And I guess the octopus that's there, the octopus isn't the celebrity, I'll, I'll tell you that in a second. Um, it may be a famous octopus, I don't know. But the octopus was kind of like up on the, on the wall, and there was like someone's hand reaching in the aquarium, kind of like petting the octopus, which I thought was really uncomfortable. But anyway, um, it like got off the side and started floating around in front of us. And I've never seen that before. It was quite an experience. And there was a door right next to us, like an emergency exit. And several people walked through the door. And and I noticed one of the people I recognized, it was Alan Alda, who was a a famous actor. He was from the show MASH from years ago. And my parents used to watch that. So I I remember him from that. But he was there with his family and they came and saw the octopus. And I didn't say anything because I felt uncomfortable. We did sneak a picture, but it was kind of neat to to see him there. I went to a a golf tournament in Pennsylvania when I was growing up that had all these celebrities there, and I got to see Michael Jordan. I didn't get his autograph, but I got to see him. I was able to get Dan Marino's autograph, which was kind of neat. Um, I saw some other people there, some athletes. This one person came up and signed every person's autograph, and I was excited. I was like, I don't know who this is, but he's signing every person. And I looked it up, and it was Al Del Greco, who was like the kicker for the Titans. And that's probably why he was signing all the autographs, because I don't think anybody cared about him, but it was nice to get his autograph either way. Um, I wanted to, to see some of the Pittsburgh athletes, and I remember seeing Jerome Bettis, who we called the bus. He was the, the running back for the Steelers, and they, they were all about like the power running game, and everyone loved him in Pittsburgh. And I was wandering around the golf course trying to find him, and I found him. I saw him driving, and I came up to where his golf cart was. It was parked outside this little store, and I didn't know where he went. And he came out of the store with like all of these snacks and goodies and junk food. And I thought it was just funny, you know, and and I followed him down and we got to meet him. That was kind of neat. And then we were walking in another spot and the trail that I was on was somehow in line with the green and somebody yelled at me and it was Charles Barkley who was about to tee off, him and a couple people. And they actually yelled down at us because I was was in the way. So I can say that I was yelled at by Charles Barkley. 
I don't have many experiences like that. One other thing, we, when we were going to get married, we were going to have in our, in our wedding some of the piano music of Jim Brickman, who is a famous pianist, and we were able to go see one of his concerts in Pennsylvania. And afterwards, someone gave me a voucher to go meet him. And I thought, well, this is kind of a neat idea. I'm going to have some of his piano music in my wedding, and I'm going to ask him what song I should have, and I'll put that in my program. Jim Brickman said that you should have this song. You know, that's kind of a neat thing. So I told my fiancé at the time that. We were excited, and we went up to meet him, and I don't know how else to say this, but he wasn't very nice. He wasn't a very nice man. He wasn't very nice to us. I said, Mr. Brickman, what song should I have in my wedding? And, and he said, well, do you have my greatest hit CD? I was like, no, and he, and he looked at like his, he was like, he doesn't even have my greatest hit CD. He said that to like his manager, and I was like, all right, buddy, I'm right here. Like, I can hear you, and uh, anyway, it wasn't a great experience, so I don't recommend meeting him, but I haven't had too many experiences meeting famous people. I, I was at work at California when I was a college student, and uh, Steve Young, the quarterback, the previous quarterback for the um, 49ers, came into our, the print shop I worked at, and we were able to meet him. But maybe you've had an experience like that where you've been able to meet a celebrity in, of the very few encounters that I've had. I'm surprised to find out, even though we elevate them to this really high level, they're just people. They're people that do the same things we do, and maybe at a different level. You know, their house may be... 50 times bigger than mine, or may have you know, nicer cars and better food, things like that. Not better coffee, but anyway, other things like that. But, but they, they may have all of these things, but really, they're just ordinary people. The heroes in my life, though, are not celebrities. They're not athletes. They're not musicians, but they're great men and women of the faith. I enjoy being in New England and being in the area where people like Jonathan Edwards and, and people uh, like David Brainerd and people like uh, D.L. Moody and, and countless people were, were in this region of the country. And we can travel to those sites and see how God used them. My heroes are, are preachers. And going to Bible college, I got to hear some, some great preachers, preachers that I just... I have so much respect for, that, that, that those are the real heroes to me. But I can honestly tell you, anytime I've gotten around any of them, I found out, wow, they seem so amazing in front of people, but they're just ordinary people. I'd like to preach you this morning about an ordinary person, somebody that has one of the most amazing testimonies of anybody in the Bible, and that is the man whose name was Saul, later converted and changed his name to Paul. On the road to Damascus, the Lord spoke to him and immediately stopped him in his tracks. And at that moment, he got saved. And he was a member of the Sanhedrin. Of the, that was the, like the Jewish uh, court system. He was one that, that, that was persecuting Christians. He got saved. And when he got saved, God changed his life, changed his direction, and he became a new person. And now, not only was he not persecuting Christians anymore, he was actually traveling getting people, telling them about Christ and starting churches and as a missionary, a proponent of the gospel instead of an opponent of the gospel. And he has an incredible testimony. He was actually the person that penned 13 books in our Bible. And you would think that Paul is somebody that you should have so much respect for and somebody that is a true hero. He actually tells us at the beginning of the passage that he read about an experience that he had 14 years prior to him writing it. It was an experience that he had never told anybody about. It was an experience that he didn't even really understand. He says, I don't even know if I physically went or if it was just a vision, but I went to heaven and I saw things that no one has seen. And I was able to experience things that no one has experienced. And he said, I can't even talk about it. And so this is someone who, if there's anybody that really should get the accolade, that should get the praise, that should be elevated, it's this man, Paul. But then he, tells, he totally changes the story and talks about a personal struggle in his life. And you don't need to do much research to find out that any of those famous people I mentioned or any celebrity, they have personal struggles, oftentimes serious ones, whether it's an addiction, whether it's a mental health issue, whether it's some struggle, but these people have struggles. 
And Paul opens up about something in his life that I'd like to preach on this morning. He says in verse 7, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. I want to preach to you for a couple minutes on that thought, the thorn in the flesh. The thorn is an interesting word. This isn't the word that's used for a crown of thorns like the thorn bushes, but it is the idea of a stake or something that's sharp that was used for torturing or impaling someone. The more you research and the more you study this out, the less you know about what his thorn actually was. I would like to say that by now, well, from my research, I could conclude this was his thorn. I have no idea. I've read about everything I could find on the subject, and every single one seemed to say something different. Some people believe that it was a person. Some people believe it was Alexander the coppersmith, who was uh, someone that he said had caused him great harm. Maybe it was some of the false teachers. Maybe it was persecution, because he had been through a lot of persecution. It could have been his past, because he had a horrible past. It could have been a direct attack from Satan, because it talks about the messenger of Satan to buffet me. It could have been some sin, or maybe some besetting sin in his life. Or it could be a physical infirmity. And there's a huge list of what people think. Some people believe it was malaria. Some people believe it was Malta fever. I don't know what that is, but it doesn't sound good. Some people believe it was epilepsy. Some people believe it was a difficulty with his vision due to some other things that he wrote. Uh, some people believe it was just a mental health issue. We don't know what it is, but here's Paul, someone that should be elevated, that should have the, 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 uh, the ability to really kind of, kind of with authority speak about how great he is. And he says this, I can't because I have a thorn in the flesh. I've got something that I'm struggling with. It was a thorn in his flesh. And the more I researched it, the more I realized that we don't know what his thorn was for a reason. I believe that if we knew what Paul's thorn in the flesh was, then it wouldn't be so relatable. If if it was a difficulty with eyesight, it might not be something that I could relate with. Although I do have really bad vision. (laughs) If it was some specific struggle, if it it was Alexander the coppersmith, well, I don't know any coppersmiths. I don't know if you do, but I don't have anyone in my life that, that, that is that thorn in my flesh. But we don't know what it is. So here he is, someone that says, I should have all the opportunity to boast. I should have every ability to to really speak on behalf of who I am and what I've done, but I can't because I have this, this, this nagging problem. I have this thorn in the flesh and it's keeping me from thinking any differently of myself than, than I really should think. And so he talks about this thorn in the flesh and I'd like to just preach on this for a few minutes because if we're honest with ourselves, we all have thorns in the flesh. Maybe it's one thing. Maybe it's a whole load of things that you struggle with that are your thorns. You see, it was a personal thing to him. It was his thorn. Your thorn may be different than my thorn. But it was something specific to him that he struggled with, and it was some issue that he had in his life that I believe it was a constant pain. I believe it was constantly there bothering him, but I believe that we can make much application of this this morning. So let's, let's talk about this thorn a little bit. First of all, the purpose of the thorn. What is the purpose of the thorn? The fact that we don't know what the thorn was is important because it shows us that God doesn't really want our focus to be on what the thorn was although I'm amazed how many commentaries I've read and everyone tries to spend most of their time talking about it, the idea is not what the thorn was. It's the fact that he had a thorn. And and it's why he had a thorn. And so God's purpose is more important than the fact that he had a thorn in his life. And and, and talking about God's purpose, it's different than Satan's purpose. Look at that. It says, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. That's not buffet, Okay, get your mind at lunches later. Not buffet, buffet. And the idea of buffet is to, the word actually means to strike with the fist. It, 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 Satan wants to torment him with this, but he's realizing that God has a greater purpose. And as we talk about thorns in the flesh, things that you might struggle with, your thorn, I want to encourage you with something this morning, that Satan's purpose and God's purpose are two different things. Satan wants nothing than to torment you. He wants nothing more than to make you miserable and to make your life as much full of trials and tribulation. But God wants to bring good. Satan wants it to make you bitter. God wants it to make you better. There's a difference in why these things are allowed in our lives. And so he digs a little bit into it and he explains, well, I'll tell you exactly why. Look at at verse number seven. 
lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given me to the thorn in the flesh. So he says this very simply. I have this so that I don't get too prideful. I have this so that I always am reminded to stay humble. So I personally, again, I don't know exactly what it was, but I believe it was something that was constantly on his mind. Whatever it was, it wasn't something that he didn't really think about, whether it was a physical ailment or something emotionally, but it was something that was constantly there, just like a nagging pain. It's something that just, you know what it's like, maybe like a toothache or, or a migraine or something that's just, man, it's so uh, debilitating because you, you really can't ignore it. And I believe it was something that was so heavy on his heart that every time he was preaching, every time he was speaking to someone, I believe he was aware of this thorn. But he says that I realize why I had this. I have this to keep me humble. Not so that I'd be miserable, not so that my life would be so full of torment and shame, but, but so that I could become a better person. I'd like to have you turn to a couple places with me. We'll stay all within these next couple books, but we'll turn around here a little bit. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We're in 2 Corinthians. Or flip past Galatians. Go to Ephesians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I learned that as General Electric Power Company. That's what I was taught. I don't know if any of you learned that. I also saw someone wrote Galatians eat pork chops. It's kind of weird, but I'll stick with, stick with the General Electric Power Company. Ephesians chapter 2. And these are all letters that Paul had written. Look at verse number 8, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, very familiar verses. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Why? Not of works, lest any man should boast. So he realizes, first of all, what, what, the, the reason why we've been saved is by saved through the grace, through the faith of God, the faith in God and Christ Jesus. Why? Because if we worked for it and earned it in ourselves, we become prideful. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning, teens, where if we tried to earn our salvation or if we could earn our salvation, it would be a cause for pride. But the fact that it was all Jesus is the opposite. We, we can't take any credit for it. It was all him that saved us. All we did was believe and, and he did all of the work. And so he realized that first of all, salvation is all God because if we did it, we could become prideful. Turn to Philippians. Philippians, the next book. Philippians chapter three. Philippians chapter three. Turn there, please. It's important to see these. Philippians chapter three. So not just salvation, but he, he talks about his past. And here he kind of recounts his, his past and, and gives a focus as to how he's where he is today when he, when, he, when he wrote this. Verse number four, Philippians chapter three. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he have whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But look at verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. So here he's saying that I could be as prideful as anybody. I have it all. I came from the right family. I did the right things. I had all of the accolades, all of the attention of the people of the world. But I realized that all the things that were important to me are nothing if I don't have Christ. And so this idea of humility is not just something that he said, but it's a, it's a, it's a mindset that Paul lived through. Turn back to Galatians. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Stay with me. Galatians chapter 6. Look at verse number 14. We're in Philippians. Turn back through Ephesians. Get to Galatians chapter 6. Look at verse 14. He says, God forbid, Galatians 6, 14, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. You don't need to turn there, but Ephesians 3, 8, he says, I am the least of all saints. 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, Christ came to save sinners of whom I am chief. 
I think it's, it's pretty understandable that it was a theme throughout Paul's life that he realized that he was nothing. He realized that anything good in his life was because of God, and anything he ever accomplished was all because of him. Humility is the key. And I think it's important to talk about humility as we study this passage. You see, the thorn was not mentioned because I believe we're supposed to, to understand that a thorn could mean many different things. But he could have just said God meant it for good. Like what Joseph said, he could have said, well, my brother's meant it for evil, God meant it for good. He could have said Satan means to buffet me, but God means it for good. But he actually explains how God wanted to use this, and he wants to use it to keep him humble. Spurgeon said, he who thinks himself to be humble is probably the proudest man in the place. As I study this, and I, I'm asking God to speak to me, I've been praying about this, and, and, and I read, found that quote, and I got kind of convicted. I'll read it again. He who thinks himself to be humble is probably the proudest man in the place. Have you ever thought that you're humble? I'm, I'm pretty humble. Oh, nope, that's pride. <laughs> you, you were just prideful in saying that you were humble. What? True humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. C.S. Lewis said, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, a great man is always willing to be little. Jonathan Edwards said, nothing sets a person so much out of the devil's reach as humility. D.L. Moody said that we can be easily too big for God to use, but we can never be too small. He said that a man can counterfeit love, he can counterfeit faith, he can counterfeit hope and all other graces, but it's very difficult to counterfeit humility. And D.L. Moody also said, the beginning of greatness is to be little. The increase of greatness is to be less but the perfection of greatness is to be nothing. Spurgeon also said, every Christian has a choice. Be humble or be humbled and allow God to do the humbling. Last quote, John Bunyan said, he that is down need no fear or fall. Why is it a problem to be prideful? I mean, that's the greatest sin we can commit against God is pride because it robs God of his glory. Isaiah 42, 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. And so Paul realizes here, he said in 1 Corinthians, that God uses the base things of the world. He said he uses the, the, the simple things. Why? So that no flesh glories in God's presence. You see, we are nothing without God. And as soon as we start thinking that we're something, we will find out that we're really nothing. And Paul has this pain, uh, he, he, he has this, this thorn, not just to torment him, not just to make his life miserable like Satan wants, but God wanted to bring it about to keep him humble, to remind Paul that he is nothing without God. And friend, we need that reminder. May God allow things like this in our life to keep us humble, to keep us from thinking that we can do anything without God's help. So the purpose was humility. But second, we see pain. Back to 2 Corinthians 12. We see the pain. He said the thorn was given to me. I believe it was a special thing that was given to him, but I also believe that we all have things that were to us. He doesn't say it was inflicted upon me. He said it was given to me. And I think just like the story of Job, God knew all about it. Just like how God knew what Job was going to go through. God didn't inflict that upon Job. It was Satan, but God knew about it. I believe God knew all about uh, Paul's thorn. Not only was it a special pain, it was a severe pain. It was something that, that hurt him greatly. He would never have, have written about it if it weren't something that was, that was, that was a great um, struggle in his life. It's the only reason why he tells us about the vision he had or, or this experience that he had. He, he, he wouldn't even have mentioned it if it weren't to, to preface why he had this thorn. So it was a severe pain. And I understand, like I said earlier, maybe it, something doesn't sound like a big deal if someone else is dealing with it, but when you're dealing with it, it's a big deal. You hear someone has a migraine, oh, I'm sorry, but when you have a migraine, when you have a pain, when you have something that you're going through, some struggle, some emotional struggle, whatever it is, it is a big deal. So it was a special pain, a severe pain, but it was also a sorrowful pain. I believe it was a great distraction for him and a constant struggle. I know that in a room with as many people as are in here this morning, I know that there's pain. And we smile behind our mask, and put on the, the face that we should. But I believe there's a lot of broken hearts this morning. 
because we have thorns. I, I don't need to say much more about the word thorn, and you know right now the thorns that you're struggling with. You know the things in your life that are a pain. You know the things that are your battles. Maybe no one else knows, but God knows. I want you to see the, the purpose, the pain, but number three, the prayer. Verse number eight, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. See, he had a request and the request was for God to remove it. And I think just the fact that it led him to God is one of the purposes of it. He went right to God. It doesn't say that he complained to everybody else. It didn't say that he, he went to the doctors or he went to someone else. He said he went to God and begged God to get rid of it. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. He brought it to God. Bring your problems to God. Go to the Lord. Cast your burdens at his feet. We need to go to God. So we see the request, but we also see a repetition. It said, yeah, I besought the Lord thrice. I don't believe that he just asked God three times in a row, take it away, take it away, take it away. I believe these were seasons where he greatly was struggling and greatly was battling and went before God and asked him to remove this. I think about Jesus in the garden asking God to remove the cup three times. Repetition. The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It says ye have not because ye ask not. And ye ask not because ye ask amiss. Maybe there's things in our life that God would answer if we would just ask him and ask him fervently more often. And so we see a request, a repetition, but the difficult part, a refusal. God said no. I, I, I wish I had a really positive thing to say here. That'll be in a minute. But there's no indication that God ever takes his thorn away from him. And again, this is where we want to know exactly what it was, because I mean, maybe it was, the, the idea that it wasn't just a little thing, but it was something like, like a stake, something that really, it, it makes it seem pretty serious that he had constantly dealing with. I would love to tell you that every time you pray to God, that the answer will be yes. That every time we ask God to take away our trial, that boom, it's gone. I would love to tell you that every struggle that you have, just give it to God and it'll just vanish. That's nowhere in the Bible. No, we're actually told to value trials. We're actually told that they make us stronger and that we need them. Sometimes the answer is no, but let, let me tell you this, that God still answered him. God didn't leave him without an answer, but the answer was no. So we see a purpose we see the pain in the prayer, two more and we'll be done. And I guess I'd like you to see a promise. God answered him, not the way that I would expect God to answer, not the way that I would want to be answered. God, take this away, please. I have this pain. I need this pain to go away. Lord, take it away, please. God says unto him, verse number nine, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. It's not the answer I would expect God to give. He gives him a sovereign answer. He did answer the prayer. And God says, okay, you want me to remove the thorn? Here's what I'll do for you. I won't remove the thorn, but I'll give you grace to get through it. And so it was a sovereign answer, but it was a sufficient grace. That word sufficient is a great word because it means it's enough. And I don't know what you're going through this morning. Again, like I said, we love to pretend like everything's great. There's no problems. My life's perfect. I never have any problems in my family, at work, my, my personal life. We know that's not true. God's grace is enough to get you through it. He has given you enough grace to get through it. It's sufficient. I'm not here telling you some self-help thing. I'm not here trying to sell you something or give you something that we have created. It's only from God. It's from heaven. It's a divine gift, but it's enough to get you through your trial, to get you through your problem. He knows your need before you even ask for it, and he has enough grace to help you get through it. I'm so thankful that grace is always there for us. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. It's God's provision for our need. It is unmerited favor, and God is always ready to just shower you with grace. And it's enough grace to get through, not just to endure, but to excel. It's a sovereign gift. It's a sufficient grace. 
but we also get a, a supreme strength from it. He says the next verse, most gladly, therefore, rather glory in my infirmities. Or, I'm sorry, I'm not there yet. Uh, he says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. When we're weak, or when, when we have a thorn, we become weak. And God says, I'm going to give you grace, and I'm going to give you strength. Grace is the goodness. Grace is the grace from God, the, 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 the blessings, that which God bestows upon us. But I'm going to give you the actual strength to get through the trial because your strength comes from we, your weakness. You see, you might be here this morning and say, I'm almost at the end of my road. I'm almost at the end of myself. I've tried this and it doesn't work. I've tried this and it doesn't work and I'm not happy. I don't have joy in my life. My life is not what it should be. I don't know. I don't know what to do. Let me tell you something. If you're at that place, you're almost there because that's where you need to get to to truly depend on God. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, not through myself, not through my own goodness, not through my history, but through Christ. Why? Because God's strength is made perfect in weakness. Look at the Bible. These Bible characters that we have pictures of that we tell kids about and that we've thought about for years, these are not perfect people. In fact, they're the opposite of that. Moses was a murderer. David, an adulterer and a murderer. Gideon, not the most confident person. The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Who? And God used these people. And we, we imagine that Moses, let my people go. The Bible says that he, he, when he answered God out of the bush, God spoke to him through the bush, that he had a problem with his speech. So it probably didn't sound like that. It may have been, he may have stuttered. He, he, he may not have been able to, he probably didn't have a very loud voice. What's the point? That God uses weaknesses but we need to depend on him and quit relying on ourselves. Man, when you think that you can do it, that's a dangerous place, my friend, because pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You think that you're good on your own. You think that you're fine and you don't need God and you can survive in your own strength. Your strength will fail you. It will run out eventually. Let me just tell you that this morning. You will come to the place when you reach empty, but God's strength is never empty. It's always there. It's always enough. It's always there when we ask for it. The well never goes dry. You can always go to God for strength. I'm so thankful for that. And so we see a promise. I'm going to give you sufficient grace. And then lastly this morning, we see the product of the, of the thorn. So what, 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 what is produced from the thorn? Three things real quick. We'll be done. What, what is produced from the thorn? First of all, a new perspective. He says a couple of phrases here that just, they, they, they like prick my heart every time I read it. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What? Are you out of your mind? I'm going to glory in my infirmities so that I can get God's power? See, the idea is that when we go through a trial, we are so focused on getting rid of the problem. But God needs to get the glory. What is God trying to teach you through this trial? It's one of the greatest things my, my father taught me. No matter what you go through in life, ask God, what is he trying to teach you through it? It's a great perspective to have, and it's not an easy one. Lord, why'd you allow this to happen? Why do I have this pain? But God uses these things to, to help us, to grow us, to teach us in a new perspective. John 3.30 says, he must increase, but I must decrease. So what is produced from the thorn? A new perspective. A second, power. It says, I, I need to glory in my infirmities. Why? That the power of Christ can rest upon me. Paul had the power of God in his life. If there's anybody in the Bible that had the power of God in life, it was Paul. I mean, you see the things that he did. You see the stories that they told, the experience they had, whether it was the snake bite, the shipwreck, um, Eutychus falling out of the window. I mean, the, 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 the stories go on and on of the things that happened during the, the lives of these apostles, and they had the power of God in their life. It wasn't them. People tried to worship them at one point, and they said, you can't worship us. It's God. And so they realized that it was God that deserved those things and God's power that was needed. We need God's power in our life. We can't do the things that we need to do in our own strength. We think that we can, that we can uh, run our home or do our job or, or, or go to school, the things that we do day to day in our own strength, but we will run out and that power comes from God. So the perspective is there, the power is there. And then lastly, 
It takes it to a whole different level. Therefore, I take pleasures in infirmities. Pleasure. And he's not just talking about the thorns anymore. I take pleasure in infirmities. That, those are like weaknesses. In reproaches, uh, like a harm or something that's hurtful. Necessities, we know what necessities are. and something that's it's a need. Persecutions, pain, distress. Uh, the word distress is like a narrow place or a calamity, an extreme affliction. He said, I take pleasure in those things for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. I would love to say I'm there. I mean, up to this point, okay, I get it. I need to glory. Now I take pleasure in these things. Last week, I think it was Monday night when we had all the wind. My, uh, my recycles had been outside in front of my house for a while because the, the, I don't know if you, if you live in Holyoke, they're really behind on the trash pickup and the recycles and there's at least my street, stuff was all over the place. And uh, it was 10 o'clock at night, kids are in bed and we hear all this noise and my recycle bin was blown over and everything was all around my yard and I'm cranky because I got to get up early in the morning and I go out and I get everything ready and I put it in the bin and I'm walking down to my garage and I slipped on black ice. <laughs> I threw the recycles in the air, I fell. I had a moment, I just laid there. <laughs> I didn't say anything I regret, but I'm glad the kids weren't around. I hurt in so many different places from one fall. I don't know if you've been through that. I was talking to some people after the early service this morning, and like literally the next day, I'm like, I didn't even touch that pot of play, that spot near it on my body, but it hurts after the fall. You know, my back, my shoulder, my, my elbow, my hip, my leg, my other leg. I'm like, what in the world happened? And we go through these things, and I, I was not laying on the floor taking pleasure in this. Uh, on the ground. I was not laying in my driveway thinking, oh, this is great. You know, I'm enjoying the, <laughs> this, this view. <laughs> I was very angry. Came in all frustrated. And literally the second it happened, I've been praying about this and, and the Lord brought this to my heart. I take pleasure in these things. Ooh. Friday morning, I'm, I'm, I'm running late to my work at the coffee shop and there's a light that's yellow and I went and it turned red after I went and I got pulled over. I didn't take pleasure when I saw the police lights turn on. I didn't get excited. Yes, thank you, Lord. This is a great way to start my day. She was actually very kind. I didn't get a ticket, so then I was excited after that. But at that moment, it could have been a very horrible way to start my day. And I know those are things, that trials that we go through. But this is speaking of, I, I, I take pleasure in these things for Christ's sake. But the idea is that the product of, of a thorn in your life could be a new perspective and realizing God's power, but realizing that God is doing something and that's why you're being attacked. I, I remember years ago, we had the winter warmer. One of the first years we had it at the Holyoke War Memorial and I got ready. I woke up that morning. The sun was shining. There was no snow, which is rare in January. We were fired up, ready to go. I mean, I was amped. I was so excited to get down there. I go out to start my car and my car won't start. I remember in that moment, getting ready to get angry, thinking, no, God is going to do something special today. And you can start to take these situations and turn them around and see that God is at work and God is doing something. And yes, that pain is there. That pain, I can't even guarantee you this morning, that pain's going to go away. I wish I could do that. I can't. You might have to live with it, but God wants to bring it up to you for good and he wants to make you better because of it. He doesn't want you to be bitter. He wants you to be better. He wants you to grow closer to him, but you need to give it to God and you need to rest in his promise that his grace is sufficient and you need to have a new perspective. We could have pleasure in these things. I don't know what you're going through this morning, but God is there to help you. Every head, but every eye closed. Let's pray. Let's stand to our feet. We'll pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Father, thank you for this passage. Thank you for every heart that's here. Lord, I don't know what the thorns are in people's lives. I don't know what kind of struggles they're going through this morning. Lord, it breaks my heart knowing that many are struggling. It breaks my heart knowing that some this morning have heavy burdens, heavy thorns that they're battling, God. I pray this message will be a help to them. I pray your word will be a help to them, Lord, that there's a reason for it. Satan wants, makes them miserable, but you want to bring about good. You want them to be humble. You want them to draw closer to you, not further from you. 
And although there's pain, they can cry out to you this morning and you will answer their prayer. And God, you will always have enough grace. Lord, I pray in this invitation that you'll work on hearts and do what only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, the piano's playing. If God spoke to you this morning, would you pray? Maybe you want to come forward, the altar's open, you can kneel at your seat, but I know that their hearts are heavy. I know that there are many that are struggling. Don't worry about other people, don't look around, but you know your thorns, you know your battles, the things that you're going through in life, and we need to depend on God's grace. We need to depend on God's grace being sufficient to get us through maybe you're not there maybe maybe you don't have any thorns and maybe you're not there yet but you maybe will be someday but many people have gotten the thorn and gotten away from God and they wander God just wants to get the glory Can we just give God the glory? Maybe you're here this morning and and it doesn't really click with you. You don't really understand God's strength. Well, you need to have what we turned to Ephesians 2 talked about saving grace. You need that saving grace in your life. And maybe you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior. We would love to tell you how you can do that, how you can be saved, how you can know for sure that heaven is your home, how you can know that your sins have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You can know that. Not just a, a wish or, a, or a, a, some dream, but actually a knowledge that Jesus did that for you. You can know that this morning. If you're here and you're saved and you're struggling, would you just cry out to God? Maybe you don't want to do it here in this room. Maybe, maybe the Lord's working on your heart. Maybe it's going to be at home someday, but later on today, tonight. But God wants to help you get through your trials. He never left Paul's side. He gave him enough grace to get through. Because when we're weak, then we're strong. Let's sing that out. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. How sweet. The sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Amen. Thank you so much for being in church this morning. And we hope you have a great afternoon. Please come back tonight. We have Brother Chad's preaching for us tonight, and we're excited about that. So that will be this evening. But I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you for being here today. And please keep the Kriyas in prayer. They'll be traveling back uh, early this week to be back with us. And we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Um, Brother Brown, would you pray for us, please? Lord, I pray you bless our afternoon and bring us safely back to your house here tonight. And we'll just thank you for it.